What are you two talking about? Oh, nothing. Just the end of the world. Chapter two of the Watchmen saga. Oh, I don't. I don't like this. It's rainy. It's stormy, and we are opening the scene at a cemetery, at a uh, memorial service, at a funeral service for a lovely chap named uh, the comedian named Mr. Edward Blake. You know, when you first came in here, you're like you're ready to talk about death, and I was like, I'm so glad the comedian is dead. But I did tell you that. What's the the new DC Watchmen sequel called? Um, Watchmen. It's not Doomsday, Doomsday Clock. Doomsday Clock. Doomsday Clock. Right. Apparently, the comedian is alive in the Doomsday Clock. Spoilers. Why? Everybody. Spoilers. Why would they bring that guy back? I don't know. I was gonna dive into that, but I'm like, what? No. Mm. And especially after reading issue two, I'm like, I don't want the comedian back in my life. What a I would say what a nihilist piece of garbage this guy is. <laughs> but for most of his life, he found humor in the fucked up -edness That's true. We're while he murdered people mercilessly. <laughs> We're definitely going to dive into that. We should probably introduce ourselves. Welcome to Who Pods Watchmen, a companion podcast to Watchmen's, to HBO's upcoming Watchmen TV series. Grant, the TV series hasn't debuted yet. I, I know. So I, I know this every day. And I'm like, why, <laughs> why isn't it here? So what are we doing? Well, we're trying to hustle through this comic. And it sucks because this comic is garbage. Have you ever read this? <laughs> it's just not a good comic. Uh, unsubscribe, uh, unsubscribe, unsubscribe. Everyone's gone. Where are they going? Um, no, we, we are going issue by issue through the original 12-issue um, comic book series that has spawned a franchise, apparently. And now they're making a TV show. They, they made a movie. They're making a TV show, which is a spinoff show. We're super excited about that. And so we decided that we're going to go issue by issue and dissect this, analyze it, discuss it. And honestly, I got to say, we did the first issue. Mm -hmm. And I think I, I had a bad approach. Oh, yeah? I mean, you had a very detailed approach. We're doing issue two today, so I guess we're going to do something a little different. I th Well, I think it was a little bit psychotic <laughs> for me to make... 20 bullet points per frame of of comic that's that's a madman's work and a, i'm not sure how interesting that was to listen to as i go and then if you look in the bottom left corner of this panel it's a podcast you, man you see three dots and those three dots are indicative of whatever podcasts are supposed to go deep aren't they it's, it's <laughs> called a deep dive that's what it, we're doing it was a deep dive yeah but too deep a dive i we drowned <laughs> it went too say, deep <laughs> Did you crack your head on the rocks below? Yeah. yeah. That's what happened. But I'm excited to talk about um, this one in a little bit more of a free form fashion way. Like we can yeah. just kind of meander through what's going on with this issue. Right. And like how how they – how Alan Moore set up the story with all the established characters and then just makes it all the richer and all the deeper. Yeah. Um, chapter 2 – I really like this one a lot. Yeah. This one is basically all about everyone having flashbacks about the comedian and how he was the biggest asshole you could ever meet. Yeah. Um, we all have that asshole friend who, <laughs> who just shoots pregnant women in the head. You know. So it's interesting. He, he does that. It's fucked up. Yeah. The comedian reminds me a lot of my dad. Oh, okay. Yeah. So issues there. Yeah. Definitely. But – I found it interesting that this one starts out with Sally. Yeah, right. So um, Spectre. Sally and, and Lori. Lori comes to visit Sally. And this is our first um, first meeting uh, with the original Silk Spectre, Sally Jupiter. Mm -hmm. uh, I kind of followed suit with you last week, and I made a bunch of bullet points <laughs> for like every page. And I just shat on that idea right before you, you're about to be like, in the very first frame. In the first frame. <laughs> well, before we jump into this, should we like go ahead and say, hey, guys, if you are listening to us, welcome all new listeners. We would love for you to go on this journey with us um, as we dissect issue after issue of this comic. You can go back and listen to our very first issue. You can pull out your comic, dust it off. And it's, it's an old-ass comic from the 80s. And you can read along with us as we 
go panel by panel or whatever we're going to do. Um, and subscribe to our, our podcast. You can find us at whopodsthewatchmen.com. You can find us on Twitter. You can find us on Facebook. You can find us on Instagram. Please follow us on all of those. Tag us on stuff. We love interacting with you guys. And we also want to say that if you guys like what you're hearing, please go to patreon.com slash whopodsthewatchmen and make a per-episode donation. Help support this little pod that is just getting on its feet. And we think this this is a, a show that will hopefully have some legs to it. We're really excited about the upcoming TV show, which is why we got an early jump on this. And we would love for you guys to join the discussion with us, join the community. Yes. Did I cover most everything? Is there a few other little bullet points we need to hit? No, I think that's it. I'm really happy you did the Patreon. I thought you were going to make me do that. No. We need to add a <laughs> few more tiers on that Patreon. I think yeah. we only have a, a Minuteman tier. Should we add a Crime Busters tier? Because it's revealed in this issue, issue number two, that the Watchmen were really never called officially the Watchmen. The Minutemen? They were originally the Minutemen, and then the new crew um, brought on by, by poor, poor Captain Metropolis, who just wants to sit home and make dioramas and, he's a sad sack. <laughs> and show, show everybody the, the, the beautiful maps and dioramas he's made. Hey, guys, look at my maps. Um, he apparently... Brought back everybody. Well, he brought back the comedian and you got, got some these, of the old, some of the new, some of the old, some of the new. Got the new recruits, and they were called the Crime Busters. And it's not clear how long they lasted. It might have been a meeting. <laughs> <laughs> it might have been that one time. Yeah, that that first meeting didn't go too well. I like that. That's a good tier. Mm-hmm. Maybe um, the the tears of uh, the tears of Rorschach. That should be a one. He does whine a lot, doesn't he? He cries yeah, he's when a, he's like, my past was terrible. He was a baby. So now I beat people up. So this issue begins with a shot of the cemetery. Um, evocative of what they're kind of doing in the first issue where they're juxtaposing the investigation of the crime scene with what actually happened with the murder of Edward Blake as he's being pushed out the window. Mm-hmm. There they do it with a series of red panels, like for the flashback. Here they have this um, juxtaposition of a funeral scene going on in New York while uh, Lori's visiting Sally in Los Angeles. And there's much brighter daytime colors with this um, contrast of this gloomy, rainy day. A a perfect setting, I think, for a a funeral. You you don't want to have a bright, sunny day for a funeral. You're like, no, I want people to be sad. Yeah. Mourn me. This is definitely right for a movie. The sky is crying. So, so yeah. I, I like that Dr. Manhattan always tele- seems to always teleport Sally into the nearest bathroom because she's obviously going to puke every time she teleports. <laughs> uh, uh, nice, I got you, boo. Put you in a bathroom. Very thoughtful. Yeah. Also kind of fucked up. I feel like she's <laughs> being riddled with, like, gamma radiation. Yeah. Here. She's totally dying of cancer. Um, which, man, have you watched, I don't want to go too much into an aside, but have you been watching Chernobyl on HBO? I saw the first episode, uh, last week. It's pretty amazing. It is so good. Yeah. And it is so bleak. Mm-hmm. And I can't watch, I can't re- come back and read this after watching that and think that, like, he's giving her so much cancer. Well, that's a subplot <laughs> later, isn't it? Is it? Yeah. Man, I don't even remember. Well, not about her getting cancer. Moloch? Uh, well, Moloch does get cancer, in, as we find and out. he was a big foe of Dr. Manhattan. In this issue. But I think uh, later on, Adrian Veidt kind of manipulates things to make the world think that Dr. Manhattan is giving everybody cancer. Oh, yeah. shit. Yeah. Diabolical. Man, that guy? Yeah. Smart guy. Diabolical. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's a really smart guy. Yeah, so uh, we, got a, we got a funeral. We got some weeping angels statues here. I think that's a reference... Uh, <laughs> An anachronistic <laughs> reference to Doctor Who. Yeah, it's a reference to the 2014 Doctor Who episode, uh, Blink. Very precious. For sure. For sure. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, so the I, I think it's great seeing how Laurie interacts with Sally in that it's a very toxic relationship. Extremely. Just like the subtle snipes that they make. I love when she lights up a cigarette and her mom just suddenly starts coughing and opening up opening windows. Opening all the doors and windows. Mom, <laughs> I'll so put dramatic. this out. It'll be fine. This character, Silk Spectre, too, she's just so obsessed with appearances or at least like the female appearance. So she's always critiquing Sally, which really just puts her on the defensive. Well, I think they both. They both are just critical of each other's appearance. Yeah, I guess so. I, I think... 
You think the mom is the, more? The mom is more. Yeah, yeah Sally. Yeah, yeah, yeah it's Sally. critical of Lori. Sally, Sally's critical of Lori. Yeah. <laughs> for, for a while here, I thought they were both named Sally. Sally and Sally Jr. Yeah, yeah. Um, it's it reminds me of Arrested Development, the relationship between um, mm-hmm. Lucille Bluth and uh, what's Portia de Rossi's character? Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> like just how they're they're just so rotten and awful and judgy of every little detail of each other's lives to each other and you just throw it back in each other's face but with a little bit of a smile about it like oh we're still trying to pretend we're being pleasant here yeah. it's like really passive aggressive it's extremely passive aggressive so sally is silk specter two or one so- sally is silk specter one that's the mom okay and yeah two is sal is Lori. Lori. okay it's it's confusing I went for a while going, wait, Sally Jupiter? I thought that was uh, the younger one. No, it's not. Okay. I think that with the contrast of reflecting on the death of the comedian and Sally and Lori kind of catching up, it gives a great – it's a great vehicle for – Alan Moore to explore the background history of this world that he's created. Because uh, if we recall, when we were discussing in issue one, that this was all predicated on Alan Moore thinking he had the chance to inherit the Charlton Comics rich history of characters. Right. And he kind of wanted to analyze that background history and then kind of subvert it and be like, no, the real practicality of superheroes in this universe would be really destructive. And there's this veneer, this this fake veneer of how we deify them and think they're pure. But there's this ugly underlying history, underbelly of what's going on there. And so using um, Lori kind of catching up with her mom is like when we see Night Owl um, – Two catching up with uh, N- Night All in One, yeah. yeah, and they're looking back at the past. But this this is now going to introduce flashbacks, um, in particular, a, a lot of stuff revolving around, like you said, Edward Blake, the comedian, and how his life kind of went and went off the rails and just got progressively more destructive. And yeah, it, it is interesting the way this comic starts because obviously. More wants to build that world where there's multi generational superheroes or costume heroes, and here we get a perfect picture of that with a mother, a mother and daughter. Yeah, yeah, one from the I guess I don't know Silver Age, Golden Age, exactly. 40s. He, gets to, he gets to have his yeah. Golden Age. He gets to have his his Silver Age um, of, of characters and chart the path of why superheroes in the real world wouldn't be a great thing because. Oh, man, I, I love at the end when you see the protesters and of end of this issue, when you see the protesters in the street mm-hmm. and you have Night Owl reflecting like, who are we really protecting if we're fighting these protesters who are mad about our existence because police are on strike because we're doing the police's job and taking all the credit. And it, it's a fascinating thing that I, I don't think is ever really addressed in other comic books. Yeah. I mean, but it seems so realistic. And so like. Of course, that's where things would likely go if there was this competition. Yeah, there's this issue really explores that theme of all the s- social and political problems that would be caused by the entrance of superheroes into our lives or costume heroes. Mm-hmm. Um, but it also introduces or continues another theme from the first issue, which is. And we see it a lot in this first scene with uh, both Silk Spectres talking to each other. Yeah. You see um, Sally kind of painting this idealistic picture of her crime fighting days when really this is a time where she was sexually assaulted and she had to hide uh, her Polish heritage for fear of, you know, racist outbreaks. And and it was she was objectified. She was horribly objectified. She was depicted in these in these porno comics and uh, being sexually assaulted. And she's like, oh, those were the good old days. Mm-hmm. And it's interesting because if you think about, well, I'm going to go here, the, the right wing perspective, um, which we get from the comedian, which we get from Rorschach, which we kind of get from um, Sally Jupiter here, they're 
largely the, that type of mindset is kind of always longing for the good old days of the 50s, of the 40s, where everything was simpler and safer and better. But that are, never are you really existed. they want to make America great again, <laughs> in a way? That's not what I'm saying. They're, they're thinking that there was a point in time that was better than mm-hmm. the current time when more people are readily accepted. <laughs> exactly. Mm. Exactly. Ah, things were better than yeah when it was just more familiar to me. Is better it's, for me. This is a, a theme and an idea that's very present and very um, accessible to us in 2019. But back then, in a comic book, it was especially a superhero comic book. It was it was new. The the curious thing though is that us, the reader, looking at this, we can't help but in a way see their point because they are presenting a bleak dystopian alternate reality that if we compare it to our modern day, we'd be like, that isn't good. Mm -hmm. They should go back to the past when they didn't have all of the problems with their current timeline that are such a result of the existence of these superheroes. I guess so. But the problem with that modern timeline depicted in this comic book is with the superheroes, you know, and because of them and because of their extraordinary abilities, the anxiety it creates in the culture. And before the problems were social, they were natural. You know, you have racist running the world. You have um, uh, misogynist running the world, you know, warmongers, warmongers. Yeah, Yeah. those were those were just natural human um, evils that were shaping the culture. I mean, Nixon got what four terms. Okay, here's yeah, five. Yeah, five. Here's um, something kind of curious. I I had a question about they have um, Dr. Manhattan and Adrian Vate and um, Dan Dryberg all standing side by side at a funeral. (laughs) And my understanding is only two of those are out as superheroes in this known world. But Dan Dryberg is still operating under a certain degree of anonymity. Right. What's he doing standing like, right? I mean, I get it for like cinema, like storytelling purposes. It just looks cool. It does. Yeah. I I like it when they um, have the preacher giving his uh, eulogy. Eulogy, yeah. And Didn't you love the fake out of Moloch with Rorschach? I mean, oh, yeah, yeah. we already know that Kovacs holding the sign outside of the funeral, outside of the funeral gates is Rorschach because we've read this before. Right. But you have a guy in this funeral hovering in the background wearing a top, wearing a fedora, and he's wearing the overcoat. Very Rorschachian. And you don't see his face and he's hovering around. And I think he's the last one of the first ones to leave. And you're like, oh, that must be Rorschach. Right. But it's not. It's the comedian's greatest foe, Moloch. Moloch. Great name. His elfin ears. Yeah. <laughs> um, the there, There's this one panel. I, I'm going to jump ahead a few pages here. That takes and has Vate, Manhattan, and Dryberg all standing side by side, mm-hmm. which is Ozymandias, Dr. Manhattan, and uh, Night Owl. And it, it just uses the gutter panel to kind of break apart and contrast them with the earth to earth, ashes to ashes, dust to dust. And I thought that was like a pretty um. powerful way of kind of. Showing all of them contemplating their mortality. Although I'm, I'm skeptical Manhattan is. He's probably just so far off the reservation he didn't give shit. Yeah. He's probably contemplating the mortality of the people around him and saying, I got to get the fuck out of here. Yeah. But yeah, you're right. Rorschach's lurking outside the gates. He isn't going to wear his costume. And he makes a point later of visiting the the gravestone of comedian to pay his respects as well. And he, he doesn't leave a flyer. He steals one. Yeah, he he takes a flower to to pin on his his jacket as a, a remembrance, which I, I thought was an interesting. It's it's a nice move. It's these little details mm-hmm. that just make these characters feel real, feel genuine in their actions. So going back to that porno comic that yeah. um, depicts Sally being the little Tijuana comics or whatever. You, the Tijuana Bible. My grandma has these. I've had some of them. Like, really? I, I went south of the border and bought a, okay. a couple of them. Yeah, like, yeah, yeah. Gotta check these guys out. I remember seeing them as a kid. She had like a, a, a bookshelf full of them. I'm like, what is this? She's like, oh, those are my funny cartoons. Do not look at them. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, these are kind of fucked up. <laughs> they're gross. Yeah, they're and hilarious. Really <laughs> gross. Some no, some... I, did, I did not like them. Yeah, okay. Mm. Yeah. Not all of them are great. <laughs> <laughs> so what did you think about that first flashback to the Minutemen days? We have this political debate 
starts out with a comedian wanting to to kick people's ass in Europe for no reason other than he's a nationalistic terroristic fuck and Sally denying her Polish heritage and and right. all this terrible stuff happening. Yeah, it's it's interesting looking back on this over on the over on our Instagram account. I've been <laughs> making posts where I'll find different people who uh, cosplay as all of these characters. Mm-hmm. And yeah. it's it's kind of fun because it's a little bit of like a treasure hunt to find um, certain like more obscure characters. Yeah, like, like these ones that just show up in like three or four panels. Exactly. I'm like, okay, I found like uh, Hooded Justice and I found like one of Mothman. I can't find any of Captain Metropolis. <laughs> but I'm like, oh, it, it's it's nice to go back and read and see – how all of them were kind of given a little bit of an identity and how just they're interacting. Just in a few panels too, yeah. I mean, this is certainly evocative of the Justice League or the original Avengers or whatever. This is supposed to be this golden age of these these pure superheroes who have all banded together for righteousness. And yet you see the cracks like immediately in this. You see how – People are kind of making these little snipes at each other, and they're a little bit more um, awful than, like, the Avengers. The Avengers fight. That's that's what they do, right? But um, you don't have the underlying racism of, oh, you're Polish. <laughs> this is going to be a problem for us interacting. You better hide that and make your last name Jupiter instead of Jusevic. Right. Or the, you know, the sexism or the... Or the attempted rape. Yeah, that's pretty bad. Yeah, um, and the the homophobia. The homophobia, yeah, that comes right after the attempted rape. Yeah, there's um, – I, I think it's pretty brutal how you see the the frame-by-frame frame, like playthrough of the comedian coming on strong initially to uh, Sally and then being like, no, this is what you want. This is what you were – like – like telling me. Yeah, he's like, oh, that sexy outfit you wear is just an invitation for me to rape you, right? Let's do this. Right. But then she returns in kind. She knows how to fight. Mm -hmm. (laughs) And she knees him in the ball, scratches his face up pretty good. And and he retaliates by punching her in the face and the stomach. And breaking her ribs. Yeah. Yeah, and it's... It's awful. This is the these, this is the story that we get the details of in in Hollis Mason's book His later, book, yeah. original Night Owl, and it's weird that the big heroic moment of this comic is Hooded Justice coming in to pull one of the superheroes off of the other during an attempted rape, only to have him called out for his. His sexual sexuality as well, and that kind of looks n- terrifying. That just neuters him in the moment. Yeah. And he stops fighting. And luckily the comedian is done with this whole situation. So he walks out. But then Hooded Justice immediately starts to shame Silk Spectre. Uh, and she in turn snipes at him a little bit. Does she? Oh, wait. Am I wrong about that? No. He um, – Oh, he does. He, yeah, yeah. He, 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 he just, just so turns cruel to her. He says like, get up. Cover yourself. You know? Yeah. It's pretty fucked up. Yeah. All of this. It, it all makes me uncomfortable. And I think that's the intent. I think Alan Moore really wanted to take that rosy glow off of how we perceive superheroes and be like, a lot of these people with power trips <laughs> are people that are awful and abusive to each other. Yes. And message received, Alan Moore. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, in page eight, I, I don't necessarily think he's too far off on a lot of this. I, the idea that power corrupts seems so pervasive that. Even a person that we see later on in this comic who seems probably the, arguably the most pure of them, Night Owl, mm-hmm. he's teaming up with with uh, the comedian mm-hmm. and he's I, – I feel like he's having to compromise on certain areas of how he would deal with certain situations. With all these people. Just because I mean, of that uneasy alliance. Yeah, and he teams up with Rorschach too earlier – well, later when we see the Crime Busters first get together – Night Owl mentions that, oh, me and Rorschach have the, the gang problem under control. But what does that look like? What's Rorschach doing to these gang members? You know, it's and, brutal. And, and how is Night Owl just standing there letting him, you know, exact this type of Rorschach violence? I mean, it feels like if there's this sort of dynasty, this um, passing of the torch between Night Owl 1 to Night Owl 2, Silk Spectre 1 to Silk Spectre 2, 
I think that there's a good case to be made that the comedian essentially was passing the torch to Rorschach and that they're yeah. they seem very similar in their their ideology, their power base. I mean, they they both kind of come from a use brutality to get what you want. Right. And I think it's interesting because I think there's a little bit of an evolution for Rorschach there in is. that regard. Yeah. Yeah, he seems to get meaner and more hardline as well, things go on. Yeah, when we see the first introduction of the Crime Busters, he's trying to stop an argument. It's like, hey guys, let's be friends. Look at how he look how articulate he is. Mm-hmm. Like later he's such a recluse that he can't communicate with anyone. Yeah. But here he seems to be like thoughtful. He seems to be engaged with the rest of the group. And I think that who he was when he started off as a as a superhero is much more the detective investigative side. Well, there's an allusion later to a case that broke him, which is this kidnapping case. I don't yeah. quite remember it. I'm looking forward to getting there. But I think the comedian talks about, yeah, he's talking to Night Owl. Mm-hmm. And Night Owl's like, where's Rorschach? He's supposed to be here. And the comedian's like, we don't – you know, that guy's crazy. He's been broken ever since he went through that kidnapping case. Yeah. And, you know, we, we later will find out what a broken childhood he had. Mm. But – Part of my impression of him was that he was always just kind of like bonkers and antisocial. And I was like, oh, wait, no. There was a point in time where he seems pretty grounded here. He's just casually standing, hands in his pockets, being a superhero with the rest of the gang, rather than some creepy dude in the, the corner eating cold beans out of a can. <laughs> and, and we do like see grumbling. that we do see that he kind of idolizes the comedian a little bit. He sticks up for him uh, uh, in the presence of Adrian Vate in the first episode or the first um, issue. And in here, he has a lot of kind words to say about him towards the end. He's pretty much like the comedian had it right. Yeah, I think, yeah, he he totally absorbed what the comedian was saying he got his perspective and i think he decided like the comedian my strength is in being more ruthless than the other guy yes like that's what i can do i can i can always escalate more um because look look at his word bubbles his word bubbles are not that same oh yeah they're not all like crinkly he has a creepy creepy looking crinkly word bubble shape when he talks in the first issue Mm -hmm. like he gives everyone the creeps. Yeah. Here he's completing full sentences. It seems like the person that's able to write so eloquently in his diary is the same person here in the comic who's able to like express himself among a group. Right. So it, it's, again, very smart. And yet it doesn't underline that for us. It doesn't make a point of that. It's just really richly rewarding on rereading this comic, like how everything was so thought out. Yeah, very much. Um, but it is it is great the contrast between one of the early meetings, the photo session of the the Minutemen, and then the first meeting of the Crime Busters slash the last meeting of the Crime Busters. <laughs> Probably, yeah. Well, I don't understand why they would keep going. Like everyone basically says, eh, "We're all going to operate independently. We don't really need this." And the comedian goes and burns Captain Metropolis's sweet little map that he made. <laughs> My map, what are you doing? So who's there? Um, Captain or, Metropolis, um, Dr. Manhattan, Silk Spectre 2, Ozymandias, uh, the comedian, and Dr. Manhattan's girlfriend. Yeah, he just brings his girlfriend along to like, <laughs> superhero meetings. Yeah, that's kind of, yeah. It, it's not implied that she has any powers. But he's no. he's totally checking out uh, Laurie. And yeah, he's looking at Laurie. Yeah. yeah, And he's wearing clothes. He's wearing a little man speedo, uh, yeah. those old timey ones. They made him wear a suit to the funeral. Mm-hmm. We don't want no big blue dicks in his funeral, man. Put Just on a like suit. Free ball in it. He loves. He's a man of nature. He went full hippie when he went. Who, did, who doesn't love that? Um, they. We also get Adrian Veidt a little bit of insight into him. In that, so well, the comedian's threatened by his intelligence. Yeah, the comedian's Clearly. threatened by his intelligence. He's attending the funeral. And you you have the comedian saying like, well, I I can see the end game of humanity here. And do you guys not all see how this has no other path forward except for the destruction of all of us? That's where this is all heading. And you and guys he, would have to be idiots not to see that. And, and being so involved with the government, he has some inside info, I'm sure, as well, as there are people ready to push this button, you know? Yeah. Yeah. And it's it's fascinating to kind of see him saying that 
and then getting the zoom in on Adrian Vate's face. Right. Um, and then you have Captain um, Captain Metropolis, like, in this one panel on page 11 of this comic, going, somebody has to do it, don't you see? Somebody has to save the world. And the, cl- the, the close-up or the foreground is Adrian Vate's face, um, contrasting him back then with him at the funeral later. And that's foreshadowing that... He is the one who went, oh, I recognize that what the comedian's saying is right. The the stars are aligned in a very destructive path, mm-hmm. and there has to be a bigger end ga- uh, a bigger plan to stop what is coming here. And I am smart enough and as, as much of a chess mastermind. Aaron Vane is a guy who does play 12-dimensional t- chess or whatever. Sure, yeah. That panel, I love that that is – not blown out to mm. be so obvious that panel where he because uh, I guess it's meant to relay that this is when the idea sparks in his mind that he has to save humanity by killing it and he's still contemplative about like this burden that he's been carrying this whole time mm-hmm. but also think about how brilliant that panel is when you uh, go back to the very first um, issue and you look at how that's doing the exact same thing as when we see uh, Rorschach in the corner on that one page, and then he's um, the, the or you see uh, Walter Kovacs on page four of issue one. Right, he's in the bottom corner, and then the same building, and there's Rorschach's hat. I mean, right. I think they like to shift time and show the same character thing, and it's right. Just a lot of uh, playing around with the same kind of storytelling devices. So what's what's weird is that the during this meeting, this flashback meeting with the crime busters who. I guess we can call them the Watchmen too. I don't know. They don't really they don't really get called the Watchmen in the comic. Uh, Watchmen is more of a, an idea of who these super powered individuals are. Watchmen is like Big Brother, mm-hmm. basically, and yeah. that's how the um, c- citizens of this society refer to superheroes with unchecked power. Yeah. So yeah, the comedian knows where things are going. He I think he literally says in thirty or forty years they're going to push the button. We're all going to get bombed to death. So. He thinks that just gives him license to do whatever the fuck he wants. It's but it's you're... all a it's all a big joke to him because yeah. he's he's lost um, a reason for believing in society. He exactly he thinks he... Just, like don't we have a later scene of like this guy killing his family, um, like kind of like a background story, and it's all like a reflection of this like idea of like everyone is so traumatized right in this time period of of unease because they know the bombs are out there and any minute could destroy everyone that you just kind of lose your grip on humanity. Yeah. And that's what happens to him. He has this, such a terrible negative perception of the world and the people in it. He feels it just gives him license to treat others like shit and to walk all over them and just to be part of the joke. Like we're all shit. So we get three people's flashbacks like the three people that are attending his funeral we get kind of their flashbacks to remembering him as well as Sally Jupiter from mm-hmm. her, um from LA where she's at right so Sally went first and she it was she is not going to that funeral yeah it was the the attempted rape and then Adrian Veidt it was the first meeting of the crime busters where where the comedian basically was like hey the world's ending someone needs to do something about it obviously very um, life-defining for him. Mm -hmm. And then you have the interaction with Dr. Manhattan and him. And this one is also, I mean, it's, it's awful. It's disturbing. All these are awful, but this one is so telling of where Dr. Manhattan's like path leads him. And so I, I think with each of these little slices of, how the comedian has influenced them. Mm-hmm. It's it's pretty powerful. I, I like this narrative device with a using the funeral to to both um, be able to be a mechanic for showing um, the the background history of the Minutemen and this character in particular, but also just rich character development for all of our other characters. Exactly. Yeah. On the surface, it is um, fleshing out who the comedian was, but really what it's doing is informing you of the heart and headspace of all our other characters. Yeah. And so with, with Dr. Manhattan, um, this is his time in Vietnam with, we won (laughs) with the comedian. And it's like, yeah, uh, we, we won the war 
And I, like comedians, like man, can you even imagine how it, how destructive it would be to the psyche of the American public if we lost a war like this? Which is <laughs> obviously more commenting on right. how it was. <laughs> it was a like we invested so much in that war only to lose and it has had profound impact not that winning would be better there's there's no winning ultimately no, there's no yeah and maybe that's the other big joke of the comedian it's there is no winner in any of this shit we're all just pawns but a vietnamese woman that he yeah apparently got pregnant and discarded like trash shows up says hey the war's over you said you'd come Take, take me care. with you. Take me with you. Take care. We're going to have a family after the war's over. Of course he has no intention of doing that. And, he, and yeah, she, Well, I mean, she does what someone would do. She fights back. She cuts his face with a broken uh, beer bottle. Does what one would do. <laughs> but this is where he gets that, that infamous, like, cheek scar. Yeah. Because you see him get hit in that same cheek twice. And it's, it's, like, um, it's like when Nick Fury... Um, loses his eye, and you're like, I don't know how he gets this scar. Yeah. Um, well, or when um, when uh, Joker's talking about his scars, you know, like, right. what was it that does it? But the first time Sally scratches his face, that's not enough for that monstrous scar. This is the one where a bottle slices up his face. That's why he's got that like face disfiguring scar. And he just shoots her point blank. A pregnant woman in the head, visibly pregnant woman. And Doctor Manhattan. A quote unquote superhero is so dispassionate about the whole thing. He's just like, he's like an Awatu, just like this passive observer of like, oh, that happened. <laughs> and it's, it's fucked up. It is pretty fucked up, but I know Dr. Manhattan and the comedian and the dead pregnant woman are the only people in the scene. Mm -hmm. So they're the ones who have to relate the themes and the story to what's going on here. And pregnant woman's dead. Uh, comedian just killed her. Dr. Manhattan is standing there seemingly in shock, but a little more just not present, just kind of observing. He's just – yeah, he's he's an alien. Yeah. He's, he's dispassionate toward everything. And in a way, the comedian basically is saying – this was this was a test of of my last hope of humanity in a way too because I pulled this trigger you could stop it you have the ability yeah but if you a person who has the ability to save all of humanity won't inter interfere with this act of violence here you won't save the rest of us that's all well and good that's I don't think that I, was ultimately his intention but it, no. I think it, it it's something he mentions a little after. he does of course he does and we're supposed to take that as this is Dr. Manhattan losing his, you know, losing his humanity more and more. This, and he we says you're drifting out of touch. We turn it into a flake. God help us all. We catch up with him 20 years later where he's even more distanced from hum humanity. What didn't sit well with me here is that Blake just committed murder of a horrible, brutal murder. And the first thing he does is call out Dr. Manhattan on his shit. Fuck you. Oh, yeah. He's, he's <laughs> awful. He's fucking terrible. He's awful. They're both awful, and it it shows that, in a way, Dr. Manhattan is still reflecting on this moment, but in a like in a, like a scientific way, it seems mm -hmm. like he's he's at the funeral in the exact same pose as he was um, when he looked at the the woman's dead body, the pregnant woman's dead body, and he's just going, hmm, hmm. kind of thing, and and it's it's bleak, and it. Gives us more insight, like you said, into who he is and what it would take for um, a person like Ozymandias to get him to step away from humanity altogether and no longer be a, a threat to his master plan. Right. Yeah. And so um, the last person that obviously we need to... Good old Dan. Yeah, have uh, their kind of reflecting on the past and, and how they were changed by their interaction with the comedian is Dan Dryberg, Night Owl 2. And this is during the last days of the riot right before the Keen Act was instituted and superheroes were outlawed from society. 
And it's interesting because they're in the owl ship. We see Archie flying around mm-hmm. and comedians out front yelling at people. And he's he's so trigger happy to spray them with rubber bullets and, and <laughs> gas tear gas all these people. You know, at least they're rubber. Yeah, yeah. it's true. Um, so the police are on strike because they're against these vigilantes taking over and basically being the not just – the enforcers of law, but really the judges here, right? Yeah. And it looks like the people are turning against the vigilantes. And the comedian sees these people as, he kind of sees them as the enemy, or at least this untamed mob that must be quelled by him and the other supers. This is when, like, comedian obviously went through phases of of different iterations of his costume. This is when <laughs> he's wearing that gimp mask right. thing. Right, yeah. It's a little unsettling. And... I think that seeing how everyone is just so angry with them, like, it, this is the, the big question that uh, Night Owl asks Comedian. Like, if we are dispersing the mob that we were supposed to protect because they no longer trust us, then who are we protecting these people from? Like, what is the role of us as a superhero in this world that doesn't want us anymore? Like, right. We, we've we driven the police away from protecting them day to day, and we can't possibly cover all of the crimes that are happening in the meantime. We're the villains. And it's such a fine line when you want to put on your hockey pants and play vigilante, but there's other people that, like, legitimately <laughs> uh, make this their day-to-day profession. And if you're just, like, glory hogging and, and running in and not being held accountable, that's a problem. And then after dispersing the crowd, we see Comedian and, and Night Owl kind of walk in the streets, getting any of the last bits of riffraff, a.k.a. regular citizens, <laughs> <laughs> off the street. And that's when they come across the, someone actually spray painting the who watches the watchmen onto the wall. Right. And... They get to reflect a little bit more on, yeah, these people don't trust us. Well, poor Dan is saying things like, what happened to the American dream? The comedian is just loving this anarchy. It gives him even more license to act like a, the sociopath that he is. It, but this time it gives him license to do it in full view of everyone. And he says it came true. The American dream came true. This is his his dream. What is that? <laughs> like, I, I, I mean, I get that he's just kind of a broken man. Mm-hmm. Like, all of these people have psychological issues. And he... Well, he hates himself. He hates the world. He hates people. And he wants to... The only way he knows how to react to any type of conflict is to bludgeon it to death. And now he's given license to do it in the street to anyone. And he's one of the people who survives the Keen Act to become a government operative right. vigilante. And yeah. what does what does that say? Because that means it feels the, pretty believable. The government, uh, the the head of state, is aligned with his worldviews and sees him as a hood ornament. And yay for him, bad for everybody else. Yeah, uh, I'm glad we don't have five terms of Nixon. <laughs> Man, can you imagine if we had a bad president? Oh, man, that would be terrible. <laughs> oh, no. Man, thank God. Uh, then, you know, it, it's funny because um, we get all of these, our main superheroes kind of interacting and getting a flashback into the comedian's past life. But with Rorschach, we get something a little bit different, which is fitting because Rorschach's <laughs> a little bit different. Yeah. Um, after everyone else leaves the funeral, you get Rorschach or you get Walter Kovacs watching a mysterious figure, like you said, wearing a trench coat that looks an awful lot like Rorschach and um, his his fedora leaving the the cemetery and walking down the street. And so he kind of camps out and follows him. And he immediately bursts through his door and starts assaulting <laughs> this man like Rorschach does. They got history. Yeah. Which is also interesting because there's this villain called Moloch who used to operate in the f- late 40s, 50s or so. Yeah. And apparently was a 
primary arch nemesis of yeah. of Doctor Manhattan, Moloch the Mystic, whatever that is. He's got these creepy elfin ears, and and he I don't know what his ability or whatever it was, but it's he tells this story of his interaction with like with yeah the comedian, and the comedian was basically. Letting, giving him a glimpse into what ultimately led to the comedian's death. And it's this secret plan. There's this island where devious plots are being hatched. There's allusions to an island, to scientists, to the end of the world. And, and God, some, you won't believe what they're doing. Yeah, it's something enough that we've seen what a destructive person the comedian is. And this is something that shook him to his core. So it must have been awful enough that even he was un- uneasy with whatever was being hatched. Yeah, it scares him. And it sounds like, what would scare the comedian? Something, what have we seen so far in the comic that scares him? It is this alien-like being, Dr. Manhattan, potentially being apathetic towards Earth and people. So it's kind of this alien force coming in that could kill everybody that he doesn't fully understand so cosmic horror exactly <laughs> yeah so it seems like what we're dealing with here what he saw or what we he heard about that he's so afraid of is another otherworldly cosmic unexplainable thing that is marching you know it's going to kill us all yeah that's kind of what i was curious about like is it the idea that adrian vate had figured out like the best way to save humanity is to give humanity a an outside force that will kill so many people, but it will ultimately bring us together in an alliance against something else, something foreign. Right. Was that what scared him? Was it like how many people would be killed in this? Is it the idea of like um, – of bringing outside alien – into this, um, I think it might be the idea of bringing you know something that is incomprehensible to him, but maybe it's also the idea that he's not wanted in the new world. Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah. No but, country for old men, kind of. Well, sure. Thing, but you know, if you want to make the world better, you you scrape away people like the comedian, and maybe he knows that is a plan. It feels like, in a way, he had an understanding of how he thought the world operated Mm -hmm. and it's it's chaotic it's brutal and in some way he found a degree of of beauty in that but when he came to understand that there are deeper forces um bigger machinations at work right that can drive destiny in a whole other way that is outside the bounds of anything he would have control over and he's now at a point where he's powerless to stop it i think in a way that broke him yeah for sure he just doesn't understand it doesn't get it doesn't know where he fits into it and it breaks him and he has an interesting moment where he i mean this is um i don't remember who was it in this comic book that was like oh it's rorschach and in his journal reflecting on like we don't – when you're a vigilante or you're a, a superhero slash vigilante like we are, who who are your real friends? You don't really have any friends anymore. Right. And You die alone in the rain. Yeah. So it's interesting that the person that he goes to confide in is a former villain that they had a an adversarial relationship with. But it's a person where he's like, I need someone to just be able to talk to. I need to vent to someone. And we at least – are cut from a similar cloth, and maybe I can, right. I can say to you, I don't know how to cope with this. Right. It's it's in a way beautiful, and tragic. And I mean, once again, when you see Rorschach's journal here after he's, well, I don't want to. I, I, I'm sorry, I don't want to move past the part where um, Moloch's talking about his cancer medicine, and and Rorschach and Rorschach's wants to like, bust him on this. <laughs> he's gonna bust him. Hey, what a dick. Yeah. <laughs> Um, and it's probably off of some just like legal drugs. Yeah, Those some herbal bad. remedy that's just kind of bullshit. Yeah, that's all. <laughs> it's it probably is. not actually helping him anyway. Yeah, but it, it's like uh, you were mentioning, like um, Doctor Manhattan giving people cancer. <laughs> right. Yeah, putting Moloch and Rorschach. You know, he lets him off the hook after he learns Moloch is dying. 
mm. of cancer, but he's like, well, I'm going to report this, this drug company anyway later. There's a shred of decency there at sure. times. Yeah. But I think it's just whatever the way the wind's blowing for Rorschach. Mm. But, um, yeah, he, he goes But back. then he goes out and he whines again. He's they like, don't make American love anymore, guys. What the <laughs> fuck up, Rorschach? He's so emo. Oh, my but God. his writing is beautiful. Yeah. And when he can compose his thoughts in his journal, I'm just like, man, the if I if I ignore how fucked up a lot of the stuff you're saying is, mm-hmm. really eloquently written. Sure. He's quite a poet well, of course, in a way. Yeah. Uh, and he's walking down the street, the familiar streets of, of the 80s Times Square or whatever, where yeah. there's strip clubs and, and nudie movie places and decadence all over the place. And he walks over to the gravestone where, like you said, he, he takes a flower. And this is where he tells a joke that, I mean, we hear this joke now repeated all over the place. Yeah. And I'm not sure if the origin of this joke is this comic or not. Do you know? I, I don't know. But the joke is, for anyone who isn't reading this. A man goes to the doctor and he says he's depressed, says life seems harsh and cruel, says he feels all alone in a threatening world where what lies ahead is vague and uncertain. Doctor says, treatment is simple. Great clown Pagliacci is in town tonight. Go and see him and that should pick you up. The man bursts into tears and says, but doctor, I am Pagliacci. Uh And... I've heard this joke repeated so many times now. Yeah. And I forgot. Is this like the origin of that? I doubt it. I mean, it's the it's the sad clown. Right. And the comedian being the Is saddest the of all of us. The sad the person scared who scared clown. Yeah, the person who puts on the smiley face for everyone else and performs for them is the one who is the saddest of all of us. Everyone thinks of like Robin Williams or something <laughs> like that. Like yeah. but it's 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 a common trope, but there's um, and I, I also love that Rorschach says that Blake saw the true face of the 20th century and chose to become a parody of it. Because, mm. yeah, that that really sums it up really well, speaking of Rorschach being so poetic. Yeah, you think of what us Americans, at least, love of our action movies. And you would think the comedian just fits in line with that. Mm-hmm. This This macho, cigar-chomping... Bro, decked out in all of his armor and and guns and just like shooting up every place and just like taking no shit from anyone. He's he's just a hero. Yeah, he's a man's man. And yeah, that is the reflection of what we still gravitate toward in a lot of our our medium. And and it, it's still just it reminds me of I, I went onto these forums recently. I, I think I talked about this a couple episodes back. Mm-hmm. But all the people who are just like, "Ah, oh, man, Rorschach's like such a wonderful hero. He, I want to have his his um, his image like as my my avatar and all my social media. Right. And why are they making all this social justice warrior stuff in the new TV show instead of like they're trying to like vilify Rorschach? And I'm like, did you guys get it? <laughs> Do you understand what they were saying? That isn't the. That isn't what under- we should strive toward. That's yeah. bad. That is <laughs> I- extreme ideology poured out in such a violent manner is bad, guys. Yeah, and we end on another quote from a, a great musician again. Elvis Costello says, "And I'm up while the dawn is breaking. Even though my heart is aching, I should be drinking a toast to absent friends instead of these comedians." That's from uh, The Comedians by Elvis Costello. And uh, the this this issue was called Absent Friends. And, yeah, reflecting on people's past. So what do you think of this issue then, Mike? This is my favorite so far. I really like this issue. The storytelling device was amazing. Of all How, two issues? Of all two issues? You this write is, this one? This number is one. number one. <laughs> issue two, number one. I'm just impressed with... The storytelling device of how each person is able to give another glimpse into the comedian, but that also reinforces who they are for us. And so we mm-hmm. we learn more about each of these characters. And it just makes me think, again, that I'm so excited that Damon Lindelof is the person who 
is going to be making this TV series because it feels so in line with, I mean, Lost and his flashbacks and using that yeah. as a narrative device to Very just much. enrich a character's backstory without it being part of the main, the current story t- timeline um, and like getting bogged down by that. It's like, oh, I can sh- show who this character is by something else that happened to him previously right. and have that reflect in what they do now right. and make it interesting or subvert expectations. And That's what's happening here, but it's also informing um, the mindset of our other characters and where they will go within the story. And just richly fleshing out this world. Mm-hmm. And I'm, I'm just so curious to see... If we'll see, like, Adrian Veidt, I mean, we'll see Adrian Veidt. Will we see Dr. Manhattan in this this future? Will we see a curiously uh, alternate dimension saved comedian pop up? Oh, this? God, no, please. Oh, I, I doubt it. There there are rumors that Justin Theroux might play Dr. Manhattan. Really? hmm Dude works out a lot. <laughs> Dude's got a big shlong. Yep. <laughs> I, check and check. Check and check. That'll he work. He totally do it. That'll work just fine. Just shave his head. Oh, he's okay, shaved okay. his head. Oh, like, that's right. Re- yeah. Link recently he shaved it for that uh, Maniac show on oh, yeah. Netflix. That's right. That'll yeah. work. Um, all right. Issue two. That was issue two. Nick, we'll be back next week with a review and discussion of issue three of the original Watchmen comic. Uh, you can find us at whopodswatchmen.com. Uh, you want people to follow you on the Twitters? Yeah, you guys can follow me. I'm on Twitter and Instagram at Baron Von Grant. I also have a Facebook page, the Grant Davis page. <laughs> you guys are welcome to go check that out. Find me on Twitter at Mike Moody and follow us on Twitter as well at Pods the Watchman. Hey, Grant. What? Who Pods the Watchman? We do. We do.